Let us rise and worship the triune God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And also to you. From Hebrews 2. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, all things exist for you and by you. And it was fitting for you to make your son, the Lord Jesus, perfect through suffering. If that was his path, how can we not expect the same if we follow in his footsteps? If Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered, how much more should we, who were born in sin, learn obedience under your fatherly discipline? So we thank you for gathering us, chastening us, and sustaining us through the week. We ask that in this worship service, you would renew our strength and unify us as your people, your prized possession. For you are not ashamed to call us brothers, and we are not ashamed to call you our God. So we bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. And all of God's people said, Amen. Our text this morning is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35. These are the words of God. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that what was done, they were, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desiredst me. Shouldst thou not also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Our God and Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you that we can come and hear your word proclaimed to us. We pray that you would do the miracle of preaching now, that you would open our ears to hear, that you would speak through me, that you would pro proclaim the gospel to your people. Conviction of sins and restoration. Lord, we pray that we would not rely upon the arm of uh, strength or of the flesh, but on the right hand of the Lord God, our uh, God Almighty. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Certain people have the uncanny ability, I don't know if uh, you have people like this in your life, but certain people have the uncanny ability to drive you crazy. Uh, and whoever just popped to your mind, I want you to hold on to who that person is. Yes, you know, there's certain people that just know the right buttons to push, to, to uh, drive you nuts, to... to to get your ire up. And it's tempting with those people in our life uh, to box them out of our lives so that we won't have to deal with their antics. It's tempting to try to uh, cordon them off, try to find a, a, a spot where you don't have to interact with them and don't have to think about them uh, any, anymore. And forgiving someone again and again is, is an unappealing course of action to us. Because it means that, well, what do you know it? They've offended you again and again. And we don't like being hurt. We don't like being offended. We don't like being wronged or sinned against. But what's, what's funny about uh, our uh, 
ire being raised at other people, that, that person in your life uh, that, that popped to mind. The, the funny thing about uh, being offended and being unwilling to forgive them or wanting to hold on to that grudge is that there's someone in your life who you are very, very good at forgiving and overlooking their faults and treating with incredible delicacy and compassion and, uh, you know, even though they are a good-for-nothing scoundrel. And that someone is yourself. <laughs> you overlook all of your faults. You like to skim them over. You like to paint yourself in the best light possible. You like to think of yourself as a good, upstanding citizen who should be uh, understood and uh, viewed with compassion. And so the fact that Jesus tells this parable uh, gets at the heart of something that is really one of the uh, underlying issues for fallen mankind. Uh, one of the sins that is most committed, if you will. You see, we, we like to forgive ourselves and we like to be treated with grace and compassion and understanding, but we don't like offering that to others. And so as we look at this parable, as we look at this text, uh, Jesus wants to go right to the heart and make us very uncomfortable with this parable. Uh, be before the parable, to, to sort of set up the context, uh, Jesus has been teaching on, you know, the, the progressive uh, rebuking of, of a brother who has sinned against you. In Matthew 18, 15 through 20, you're to go to your brother and, and confront him if he's wronged you and say, you've done me wrong. And if he admits it, great, and confesses it and uh, asks forgiveness, uh, the relationship is restored. But if, if, he in, if he remains entrenched, you're to bring the two or three witnesses as the, the law of Moses required. You're to bring them along um, and, and walk through this process uh, seeking restoration of this, this brother who has wronged you. So that's the context. And then afterwards, uh, Peter, uh, some, sometime afterwards, whether it was immediate or sometime afterwards, Peter raises this question of, so how many times if my brother sins against me, am I supposed to go through that process? How many times is there a point at which that brother has just, he's, he's done, I don't have to deal with him? Um, how many times should an offending brother be forgiven? How many times can he push my button and ask forgiveness and I say, all right, it's okay, I forgive you? How many times do we have to go through that process before I can just sort of wash my hands of him and just cut him out of my life and, and, and box him out? And, and Peter, uh, very uh, holy uh, and, and courageous, says, if, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? That seems like a good number. That seems like uh, being very reasonable and, and, and going the distance. And what's interesting is that the scribes and Pharisees had taken a, a couple passages, probably from Amos, uh, that reference uh, uh, God uh, saying, I will, yea, for three sins and even for four, I will come uh, now in, in judgment upon Israel, upon Damascus, and upon Judah. And so the scribes and Pharisees took that and said, see, God, he said three or four, so we're going to draw the line at three. If your brother sins against you three times, you forgive him, you forgive him, you forgive him, and then after that, you've done, you've done what you could, you know, <laughs> and move on. And so Peter here is really going above and beyond by saying, seven times, should I forgive him seven times? And Jesus' response uh, shows that keeping a scorecard, having that in the back of your mind when you're forgiving someone, that, okay, this is the first time, I've got... I've got two or six, depending on which scribe, or if you follow Peter's example, or if you follow the scribe's example. I've got two, maybe six, up to six more times that I'm going to forgive this guy, and then he's done. His dance card is full, and we're, we're done with this fella. And Jesus' response shows that keeping a scorecard of your brother's offenses against you is contrary. It runs against the grain. It is entirely uh, contradictory. It's a, a live contradiction uh, to the true spirit of forgiveness. And the number that Jesus gives, the 70 times 7, uh, shows that keeping, uh, shows that um, it, it's clearly meant to indicate that you're to forgive your brother regardless of the number of times he offends you. There in verse 22 that Jesus says, 
I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And those numbers uh, probably harken back, or at least an allusion to some of the vengeance protections, if you recall the story of Cain and then his, uh, one of his descendants, Lamech, um, where Cain was, if, if somebody killed him, there would be vengeance. Uh, he said, seven generations, you can keep me safe. Vengeance can't be taken on me. And then Lamech says, when he kills a man, says, 70 times seven, you know, 70 and seven uh, generations. Nobody, nobody touched me. And so these vengeance protections said, you know, I, I can be shielded off, even though I've done wrong, I can be shielded off from, from vengeance being brought upon me. And this, so Jesus takes it and ramps it up and says, if your brother sins against you, you're not supposed to be counting until you can bring vengeance upon him, until you can finally let the hammer fall on him. You're to forgive from your heart continually, to have an, have an attitude and a disposition of compassion and pity and readiness to forgive, even continu- continually. And so Jesus illustrates this uh, with, with one, of the, one of his more famous and poignant parables. And the parable is in, in three scenes. Uh, the first episode is that of a king taking account and forgiving a servant who begged for clemency. And, and so, you know, he, he opens the books, and you might think he starts at the top and says, who owes me the most? And uh, this guy was probably close to the top, this, this servant, given the amount that he owed. So the reckoning comes, and though this servant had done nothing up to that point, it would seem, to pay off those debts, all of a sudden his mind changes when the uh, when reckoning is due, when the debt is called in. And he begs and and asks for, for clemency. And even though he owed an insurmountable debt of 10,000 talents, he begs. He says, I'll pay it back. And, and Luther points out that this is, uh, he, he, he points out that when, when the law convicts us of the sin against the living God, oftentimes the first instinct is to put on robes of self-righteousness and say, oh, I can pay it back. Believe me, I, I'll, 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 I'll pay you what I owe. The, the funny thing, though, the humor in this parable is that um, it would take a day laborer about 20 years to earn one talent. So all you math whizzes out there, so one talent, and this guy owes 10 talents, and it would take 20 years for a day laborer to earn one talent. That, that basically means this servant owed the equivalent of 200,000 years of labor, of day labor. And he says, I'll pay it back. <laughs> You're a hard worker, are you? <laughs> This guy has a high opinion of his, of his work ethic. We're talking billions of dollars. We're talking a, a, an enormous debt. And he begs and, and pleads for forgiveness. And what does the king do? He takes pity on him, and he forgives. And, and, and the language there is, is striking in that even though this guy is saying, I'll pay it back, the king says, you're loosed from it. You're free of it. It's done. And the, the immediacy of the, the forgiveness, it, it went into effect immediately. The second episode sees this same servant hunting down or, or running into a fellow servant, and he was reminded, wait a second, you owe me something. This fellow servant owed him a hundred days' wages. And and sometimes when when this parable is taught, um, it's it's contrasted as, oh, look at this big, big amount that the first servant owed the king, and look at this little these these pennies that this other servant owed him. But that's actually not what's what's going on here. It's a significant, it's not a negligible amount that this fellow servant owed him. It was, you know, probably. You know, a third of a year's wages. So if you do the quick math on what you make, put yourself in those shoes. Would you be willing 
to let slide 10 or, or 20K. Say, it's all right. Pay it back when you can or wash the debt clean. So it's not a negligible amount. But this forgiven servant, rather than extending the same forgiveness that he had received and the same mercy that he had received, he refuses to forgive his fellow servant who is indebted to him, and he throws him into prison until the debt is repaid, verses 28 through 30. In the third episode, the news, the fellow servants hear of this, and they go, they're, they're just torn up by this, and they go, this is not right. They're, they're indignant by this. They see the injustice there. They see the, 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 uh, the fact this, this servant didn't get it. And so news travels back to the king who, it says, in great wrath, in great anger, he rebukes the pitiless servant. He calls him wicked. He reverses his decision and turns him over to the tormentors until his debt is paid in full. There in verses 31 through 34. And Jesus concludes this parable. He lets it hit very heavy. Jesus concludes this parable by warning that his father will do likewise unto those who do not, from the heart, forgive their brother. And one of the things we learn from this parable, one of the things we see, is that Jesus wants us to note that the father expects his forgiveness to be imitated. That we're to see the great debt which God has forgiven us, the crimes which we've committed, the transgressions of the law which we have committed, the debts which we ought to have paid, we're to see that forgiveness that our God has shown us, that the Father has shown us, and we're to imitate it. Our forgiveness is imitated of our Father. And Paul, Paul, Paul's epistles re repeat this in, in Ephesians 4.32 he says, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Notice that. Even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That, that your, your, your kindness, your tender-heartedness, your forgiving of one another is in light of and in imitation of God's forgiveness of you through Christ. And again, in Colossians 3, 12 and 13, he says, Paul says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, and again, here it is, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. What's striking about the passage there in Colossians, and I, I like to point this out when I'm doing premarital counseling, is that uh, this passage, the put on uh, uh, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, and forgiving one another, that uh, uh, directly precedes, and he then Paul then turns and says, all right, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Servants, submit to your masters. Because those relationships of wife to husband and husband to wife and, and children to parents and, and servant to master are the most likely relationships where you're going to need to forgive, where you're going to have offenses against each other. But all of our forgiveness is to be imitative of God's forgiveness of us through Christ. The root of our forbearance and our our patience towards, and our forgiveness of each other is rooted in the gospel of Christ's forgiveness of us, that we preach the forgiveness of sins. And if you believe the gospel, and if the gospel is at work in you, that same forgiveness is to be working outward in your relationships towards your husband or towards your wife, towards your parents, towards your employer. But that's not very often what uh, society does, what people do. Um, I think of the, the episode in um, The Magician's Nephew, C.S. Lewis's book, The Magician's Nephew, when the two children find the wood between the world with all the ponds in it where they can travel to uh, other places, other worlds. Uh, and, and they end up, their first adventure, they end up in this 
barren wasteland, this ruin uh, of a world where everything is in, uh, is in disrepair. The sun is cold. The wind is stale. The plants and vegetation aren't even growing. And they wander around, and they finally find that magic hall of, of images, of, of, of statues. And Lewis's description of it is really, I think, profound, in that he, they start at one end of the hall, and they describe it as the people there were uh, royally arrayed, and were, uh, were, they looked cheerful and merry, and like the sort of people you would want to be with. And then as they proceeded down, basically through history of, of that world, they saw people who were stern and, and hard, and, and, and you'd have to mind your P's and Q's around them. And then finally, the description at the very end is that these were people who were, who were despairing people. And Lewis says that they looked like they had done horrible things and had had horrible things done to them. And then later we find out what had happened in that world. That offense after offense was left unforgiven. Battle after battle, war after war, escalating, 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 all against all. Us versus them, Hatfield and McCoy. That, that turmoil growing until Jadis, the, the, the queen of that land, her sister, she was at war with her sister, and Jadis had discovered the deplorable word where she could wipe out everybody. Now, I don't know what sort of conflicts you have been in, but have you ever been tempted? Boy, I wish I had the deplorable word. <laughs> I wish I could whisper that one and all, all my problems are gone. <laughs> all, all of you are gone. But that's what envy and bitterness and unforgiveness and, and unrestored relationships will always escalate and escalate and escalate until someone tries to pull some stunt similar to the deplorable word. But the gospel comes along and calls us as believers, as those who have been forgiven. We've, we've heard it earlier in the service that your sins are forgiven through Christ. We proclaim that here in this service, that through the blood of Jesus, you are forgiven of your sins. And God then calls you to imitate. That imitative quality of our earthly forgiveness carries bolder-sized ramifications. Imitating God's forgiveness means that an unbeliever is incapable of truly forgiving. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But they're un unable to truly forgive because they're unable to imitate God without the new birth. They have not received the forgiveness that they are to imitate. And it also means that a child of God who refuses to forgive, who is holding on to their grievances, who is holding on to those bitterness and is uh, offended at every turn, is going to be all tied up in knots because they have clearly not ga grasped how great a debt God has forgiven them. They're going to be a walking contradiction. And I think we see this in our current moment in, in, in history, in our nation. When we have offenses on various sides of, of political and, and social and ethnic divides. And, and what's, what's striking is that we all long for the, the, the peace and the, the harmony, as it were. And, and you can see mankind trying to uh, concoct ways to get there. But nobody wants to seek forgiveness for wrongs done nor extend forgiveness. So while we must hold one doctrine firmly, that our salvation is secure, we really do need to hear this profound warning which Christ attaches to unforgiveness. In Matthew 6, 12, when he's teaching on prayer, how should we pray? He tells his disciples to pray part of that prayer, and we'll sing it in a minute. We sing it each Lord's Day. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then later on in chapter 6 of Matthew, Jesus says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
One, one commentator surely points out that refusal to forgive, refusing to forgive, is a decision for vengeance. It's saying, uh uh uh, I'm not gonna let this one slide, and I'm gonna let this wrath of mine fall hot and heavy upon the one who has transgressed me. I'm deciding to be the victim, the jury, and the judge all in one, and I'm gonna bring down all of my wrath upon the one who has offended me. But since our forgiveness is imitative of Christ's forgiveness, unforgiveness indicates a lack of grasping what the Father has done for you. Man always connives ways to avoid God's clear command for seeking and giving forgiveness. And Christ's warning about unforgiveness, both here in our text and, and, and elsewhere, that warning about unforgiveness should make us wary of the various, we might call them wildflowers of forgiveness or uh, mutant uh, forgiveness that look pretty from a distance, but are in fact destructive weeds. So for instance, first of all, in modern psychology, it treats forgiveness, they'll maybe even use the term forgiveness, but they treat it therapeutically. Uh, so you're laying there with your, your therapist, and, and how did that make you feel? And, and, uh, and, and the endeavor, you're, you're encouraged to endeavor to drudge up forgiveness feelings in order to feel better about yourself, in order for you to be whole. It's not concerned with your brother. It's not concerned with your neighbor. It's not concerned with the one who has offended you. It's all so that your conscience might be soothed. In this approach, in this mindset, viewing forgiveness therapeutically, reconciliation is, is of no concern. Reconciliation isn't on the radar. And along with this vein, we, we might often be tempted to think that we need to search within ourselves for forgiveness feelings before we forgive. That you need to look within yourself until you feel forgiving feelings towards the person who has offended you. But all that's looking for is something to make you feel better. It's not looking for the relationship to be restored and made whole. It's not looking to see your brother and your relationship made right again, strengthened. The other thing we see is that we won't forgive until we've made them, made the offending party crawl and grovel. And we see this oftentimes where, uh, you know, you'll see the, the people on, the, the companies or the, the celebrities on on social media apologizing or asking forgiveness, this was not my true self, what I did or what I said or who I was. And you'll notice that the mob comes along and doesn't accept the apology. They make them crawl. You haven't done enough. You haven't said enough. We doubt it. But biblically, forgiveness is a promise. It's an act of the will. It's not a, a feeling. It's an act of the will to remember not. Think of the, the, the verses in the Psalms many times where it says, he'll, God promises to remember not our sins against us. It's an act of the will. Forgetting is passive, where just the, the, the passage of time might make me forget what happened or what I did or, or what they did to me, whereas remembering not is an active thing. It is proactive. It is saying, I am promising to the one who has offended me, I will remember not this sin against you. I will put it out of mind. I will not just twiddle my thumbs until time, enough time has passed where I don't really recall and the details are fuzzy, but I am promising to remember not this sin against me. A second imposter is that of the common apology. Uh, I'm sorry, saying I'm sorry is different from saying, I was wrong for X, Y, Z. Please forgive me. And, and those of you who know your words well and etymology well know that apology means defense. Apologizing is offering a defense. Uh, again, you'll see the celebrity say, it was not, I was, what I said was not uh, in accordance with my true self. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> That's... There, there, that's who you are. That's what you said. 
And notice how apologies become weaponized in our culture. Uh, apologizing is, is, is weaponized, and it's done for PR purposes. Like, oh, the brand has been hurt by this episode. So we need to apologize so we can sort of do some damage control. Or it is utilized by one's enemies to apply pressure to get a, a political or a social opponent off the stage. If we can get them to admit and apologize and say, I'm sorry, this wasn't my true self, and I was not admitting the wrongness or, or rightness of the, the act done, but a mere just apology, brushing over it, it's often done to just apply pressure so that they admit, hey, they did, they did something that everybody was uh, frowning at, and therefore we can sort of brush them off the stage now, removing a political or social opponent. And the third, a third variety of pseudo-forgiveness is when we, we seek to just sweep things under the rug. Again, it's the letting time pass. But this is just loveless apathy. This, is a not, this isn't being concerned uh, for seeing your brother restored or your relationship restored. If you would truly imitate Christ, you must not let things just slide. But you need to address them for the sake of the relationship. In fact, this opens up to us to operate in the realm of objective truth rather than subjective feelings. Uh, Ken Sandy uh, summarizes this well. He says, forgiveness is not excusing. Forgiveness is the exact opposite of excusing. The very fact that forgiveness is needed and granted indicates that what someone did was wrong and inexcusable. In other words, Rather than just sweeping things under the rug, when you go to your brother, as Jesus uh, instructs us to do earlier in, the, in chapter 18, when you go to your brother, when he's wronged you, when he's indeed sinned against you, when he's indeed uh, uh, stolen from you or lied to you or uh, hurt you uh, practically in, in some clear way in your, in your property or in your reputation, in going to him, you're actually dealing in the realm of objective truth, not just, oh, my, my feelings were hurt or I, I felt kind of funky by what you did. When there's a real wrong done and you go to your brother to say this was wrong and you can point to scripture and you can point to uh, what, what was done wrong and it's not just, hey, this kind of made me feel, feel bad, but when you're coming and saying an objective truth, you're not just excusing it, you're not just saying, oh, it's all right, you're not just letting it be swept under the rug, you're actually dealing in the realm of objective truth. And thus, you're able to deal truthfully. And your brother who wronged you is able to admit the truth. Able to admit his wrong. But what we should notice in all of this is that forgiveness is not an end in and of itself. It's, it's a means unto something far grander. We can see this in, what, in, in the whole story, the whole arc of Scripture. It shows that God's aim in redeeming mankind is more than merely forgiving him for his crimes in Eden. In fact, God is preparing a garden city whose glory outshines the sun. God is restoring what was lost in Eden, and even glorifying and beautifying and making it better than it was in Eden. And he's restoring what was lost in Eden in an incomprehensibly glorified way. And so, in our earthly relationships, this means that merely forgiving the offense is, is, not, is not the end goal. A restored, a glorified relationship is the goal. In essence, forgiveness is a means to a more glorious marriage, friendship, relationship, society. And that's, that's what we see in this current moment is that if forgiveness was offered and extended and accepted and sought, would the strife be truly over? Or is there an itch within these competing parties within our society that are demanding justice and, and wanting some semblance of wrongs made right 
Is there just a desire to one-up the ones who have, have offended us? To, to put them in their place? Or is there truly a desire for forgiveness to be given and relationship to be restored? Because all the various weeds of pseudo-forgiveness, which are all, in fact, of the genus known as bitterness, they're, they're going to quickly overshadow and strangle the fruits of grace. So, keeping short accounts with your fellow servants is vital for the health of the garden of your life. Bitterness would turn your garden into an eyesore, but redemptive grace takes your garden... And it's not just taking the weeds out, but what, what forgiveness does is it restores this relationship. It, it makes way for this relationship, this garden of your life, to not just have the weeds of bitterness pulled, but it's also a restoring and a beautifying and a glorifying of the garden of your life into a full-fledged farm with a gourmet restaurant where others can come and be nourished and encouraged and built up by God's grace in your life and in God's grace in your marriage and in your relationships. So when we forgive the hundred pence our brother owes us, our imitation of what God has done for us is on what God has forgiven us of, that is on display. And in this way, you not only enjoy the blessings of a restored relation of restored relationships and clear consciences you also enjoy the great privilege of displaying to the onlooking world the reconciliation that is found in the gospel in other words your uh, this parable shows us that when when god forgives us we're to go out and forgive forgive even the significant debts against us the significant wrongs that are done to us and in so doing we are displaying to the world the gospel, the forgiveness and the reconciliation found in the gospel. That though the bone was broken, forgiveness sets the bone, and in the end, it is made stronger. And we proclaim that in our forgiveness and our refusing to hold grievances against each other. We proclaim that God the Father reconciling himself with fallen man through Christ we are proclaiming through our forgiveness of our wife or our husband or our parents or those who have wronged us, when we have that disposition of readiness to forgive, we are proclaiming that God the Father is reconciling himself with fallen man through Christ. And we, we must not forget that our overarching aim in all of this, in forgiving our brother, is the glorification of God, is in proclaiming the gospel through our lips and through our lives. Father, we thank you that you forgive us a great debt. That through Christ, our sins are passed over. As the old hymn says, we're redeemed, restored, forgiven through Jesus' precious blood. We're heirs of his home in heaven. So praise to our pardoning God. Father, we pray you give us grace in our individual relationships to seek and to offer forgiveness and to extend forgiveness when it is asked. We pray in our society that as the gospel is preached, we would see the restoration, the reconciliation amidst ethnic groups, amidst enemies, so that all the world may know, so that the earth may be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as water covers the sea. We now use the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, if you've spent any time in broad evangelical circles, you're probably familiar with the cliche, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. The problem with this cliche is obviously not in the substance of it. Rather, it's in the fact that all too often such slogans grow so familiar that they plink off our head like a ping pong ball. God just gave you a breath. God gives you sunshine and sends awe-inspiring thunderstorms. He invented lemons so we could make lemonade. He gave the Chinese the cleverness to make fireworks so that we can make a big deal out of grand occasions of celebration. 
God is smiling upon us now as his beloved children and has accepted our prayers and worship because we are clothed in white robes which the, his son's blood made clean for us. God not only has forgiven your sins, but he declares you to be not guilty. The psalmist declares this when he proclaims, O oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Psalm 31, 19. And the root of this goodness is the fellowship we have with him through his son's body and blood. And the crown of this goodness is the robe of Christ's righteousness, which he clothes us in. He covers us and he fills us and he brings us to himself. Here is goodness, guilt forgiven, sins passed over, praises accepted, fellowship with God himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, the source and wellspring of all goodness. So reflect on God's goodness and mercy, which have followed you so faithfully. And then receive and enjoy that goodness by taking in Christ's broken body and spilled blood and the grace that God ministers to you through it. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life, who was counted as sin that we, so that we might be counted as the righteousness of God. And not only that, you not only reckon us righteous, but you now feed us with your very life and your very self. It's in the mighty and most holy name of Jesus that we give thanks. Amen. God has forgiven you. He's forgiven you a great debt. So go and do likewise. You want practical Christianity? You want to work out your faith? Well, forgive those who have sinned against you. Now hear the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And amen. amen.